In the police report, it goes on to say when Aiken was confronted, she admitted she took the money from the fundraiser and deposited it into her own personal account for a total amount of nearly $6,000. According to this police report, cops did contact Aiken on the phone, asked her to come to the station to answer some questions. She said she would, but she was a no-show. I know my son was very angry uh, about someone taking something that didn't belong to them. The parents contacted the defenders and I was able to track down Jennifer Aiken, asked her to share her side of her story, and surprisingly, she that. agreed. I did not take it intentionally. I was going through tough times. I had a bad mechanic in Oxford. Aiken's excuse for stealing, she had too many bills to pay. Sales. They worked really hard to earn the money and then you just took it. I, trust me, I wasn't just taking it. I was not trying to hurt anybody and I know it hurts them and I'm sorry and I am wanting to pay it back and I am working on trying to find out how I can pay it back. That's not true. She never contacted the Cub Scouts and remember, she'd never meet with police. If How I were you able to take this money? Were you just in charge of the account? I was given the money from the popcorn sales and I did not put it directly into the Cub Scout account. What did you use the money for? I needed to pay my bills. And at this point I became homeless this year. I, I've had a really tough time. Cub Scout Pack number 182 also had a tough time. No camp, no trips to the submarine, and no word when or if they'll ever get their six grand back. After our confrontation, police did arrest Jennifer Aiken on that warrant for embezzlement. She was able to post bond and was in court this past Thursday. Aiken is expected back in court later this month for a preliminary hearing. Many parents of the Cub Scouts say they plan to be in court at that time. With the permission of local parents, we put some kids to the test recently. They thought they were meeting me at the park to talk about their favorite vacation spots in Michigan. But when I stepped away to set up for the interview, that's when our plan went into action. What would your kid do? After a couple of minutes of waiting, our undercover photographer approaches. Just took a couple pictures and you guys look really good on tape. Thank you. Nice. What's your name? Uh, Quinn. Quinn? Q-U-I-N-N? -N? Yes. All right. And what's your phone number? <gasps> Time to let the children know what was really going on. Well, can I tell you guys something? That was a test. Why did you tell him that? I was nervous. So you were nervous, and you thought by telling your school he might go away? Yeah. You shouldn't give out any information, because even with a small amount of information, it could turn out he could be someone really bad, and it could just not turn out right. Now he knows your first name, and now he knows what school you go to. I think they, they did well, mm -hmm. but they, it was a good example of how to be more cautious. Studies show most children won't wake up when a smoke detector goes off because they're in a deep, deep sleep. Studies also show that most parents keep their smoke detector right there in the hallway instead of the children's room. And as you're about to see, that can be a big mistake. The fire chief starts the smoke machine upstairs near Gavin and Lexi's bedroom. The Lefevers, like most families, have their smoke detector in the hallway. I'm downstairs with John and Heidi, watching their children from our hidden cameras in their rooms as they sleep. Oh, she just moved. She just moved. 4.45. Go on up. Mom goes to get her daughter. So did you just hear the alarm just right when you lifted up? Because it was going off for five minutes almost. That's kind of scary that you didn't wake up. You know, you really don't know how your kids are going to react until you... Try this test at home. A scary reality lesson, but mom and dad are thankful they took part. A night the Lefevers will never forget. The story starts with seven boys playing on the ice, ages 10 to 14. Their decision to play that day started a life-saving chain of events. And I was excited because I thought there was going to be a big fish coming, but that was the carbon monoxide starting to set in. We were pulling like an old sled that we found on the ice. We saw a lady come on on the ice. She looked pretty frantic. She said that that her boyfriend was in a shanty, in his shanty, and he passed he passed out. In the meantime, Vinny arrived at the shanty. I shouted, "Is anyone in there?" And I just said, "Please help." The doctor said that my uh, 
I was five minutes away from dying. You got me up. Thank you. Recently, Local 4 reunited Eric, Kelsey, and the familiar faces that helped him back at the home where Eric's life was saved. They're good people. They brought me in their home and saved my life here. 